Hi everyone, this is Gary Wilson, and welcome to tonight's live workshop, excuse me, live weekly webinar for investor agents, uh, for those who are learning how to flip, and for those who are learning how to buy rentals. Um, all three are on board, and we've got a great mix of people here. We've got some of the very first students we've ever had in the program on tonight, and some of the most recent. <laughs> Bruce, so we've got the uh, Ray from Pittsburgh and Chris from Phoenix, the, the, the senior most veteran student and the, their newest brand new student on board. So welcome aboard both of you. Um, tonight what we're going to go over is the letter that we use to send to property owners <coughs> who own properties that we believe we can sell. We can, you know, and typically sell to our to our buyer clients. So we're going to go over that tonight. Uh, just to recap though of where we come just this year, so far this year, the beginning of the year, actually starting the week between Christmas and New Year's, um, we, we, we started in the material from the beginning. We didn't get into like module three, for example, but we did get into modules one and two in depth and in detail. So if you're brand new uh, and you're looking for webinars where we go over some of the new material that you've just gotten, start back at the, I think it was uh, Tuesday the 20... Ninth, I can't remember exactly, but in any case, um, the Tuesday between Christmas and New Year's, we would have gone over Module 1, and then in subsequent weeks, we would have done a little bit more Module 1 and, and mostly in Module 2, okay? Now, what we're doing is we're going through a lot of marketing. So beginning a, a few weeks ago, we started in on, on marketing campaigns. So, we've, so far, we've done the workshop. We've done the booklet, and tonight is the letter. And for those of you who have an interest in any other subject, uh, whatever it is, please let me know via email or text message if you like, and we will make sure we cover that subject in the very next webinar that we do, do which will be next week. And that webinar next week, by the way, is going to be Tuesday night, the 8th. I got, well, it's the day I, I arrive back to Phoenix um, so that'll be a uh, five o'clock Phoenix time, seven o'clock Eastern time. Eastern time, excuse me. For those of you who are in uh, a Central, of course, that's six, and in California, that's four o'clock. Um, any case, I just gave my schedule for those of you who are just getting on here. More of you just logged in. I'm in uh, New Mexico today and tomorrow. Albuquerque is followed by Santa Fe. Uh, the rest of the week, I won't be teaching, but I'll be in Phoenix at a conference. The 7th, excuse me, I said the 8th before. Monday the 7th, I'll be in Tucson teaching. Back to Phoenix on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of next week, that's the 9th, 10th, and 11th, I'll be teaching back in Phoenix. So you can always check the events page on the My Investment Services we uh, website for the upcoming classes I'm teaching. Um, beyond that, we're going to have some a lot of California dates added because beginning March 14th, I'll be back in Southern California, back in the L.A. area for two weeks teaching, followed by a week off, and then, like I said earlier, back in Pittsburgh for most of the week of April 4th. So in any case, uh, keep that in mind. Um, I'm glad to stop in and visit you guys when I'm, when I'm coming back to an area. Um, and it can even help you out with your, your live workshops, okay? So let's check the question box here real quick. Uh, so far, I don't see any questions. So everybody, if you do have questions with anything that you've been doing in the last week, uh, by all means, please uh, let me know. Okay, use the question box to type them in. Other than that, uh, we're going to get started here. So, okay, here's the letter. By the way, I'm going to reduce my panel so I won't be able to see if you have questions for the moment. So, hey, so uh, if you do have questions, I will drop back in every few moments. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go over this letter in detail. Now, some of you, this is going to be pretty fresh in your minds because we go over this in the classes that I teach at the Market Center. So some of you, like Chris, will have just seen this not more than a few days ago, but we're going to get into a little bit more detail, not just on the letter, guys, but hold on. If you're already familiar with the letter, don't worry. I'm going to show you after this how we actually use it. I'm going to show you how to access county courthouse records online to find the correct people to use this letter to send to. Okay, we'll also use our, uh, our tax assessor database to get more information. So without further ado, I'm going to reduce the panel. And now I can't see you, so uh, if you've got a question, just type it in. I'll get back there in a few minutes. Okay, this is the actual format and content of the, the letter I used myself. And the letter over the years uh, evolved and reduced in size dramatically. This letter used to be a lot bigger. 
the body of it right here was much, 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 much bigger. Okay, and what we realized that me and the folks that I had working with me over the years is that over time, as we reduced the size of the letter, our our return call rate went way up. It kept going up and up and up. The smaller the letter, the more calls we got. Okay, now at the top, I'm going to leave this optional. I always like to put a top, disclose who I am. I'm Keller Williams. I'm, this is the Win Realty team. Here's the contact information um, and address of the office. Now, a lot of you would rather put that down here. And you can see down here I have more contact information. It's different. This was, this was my personal business office address, um, not a business center, but it was where I conduct the business. If you notice, it's different than the KW office address. So here's what I would tell you right out of the gate. You can test it both ways. You can test this letter by putting all this up front. Okay, initially, this is your header. And you can also test it without having any of this up front at all. And you start off with just the salutation, dear Clay, you know, dear, dear Ray, dear Gary, dear whatever. Okay, so I want you to write that down. Remember, try some versions of the letter with the header and some without. Always remember, though, that no matter what, at some place in your letter, you've got to disclose that you're a realtor. you got to disclose your, your broker's address. Okay, the name of the company you're with, the name of your broker, Keller Williams, always has to be big big letters, and your your contact information, all right? That's all, at physical address, name of broker, and phone number are all mandatory. So what I'm suggesting here is you can try it with this up top, you can try it without this up top, but put it down at the bottom, and you would modify this block down here to satisfy the legal requirements of disclosure. Okay, that's point number one. Okay, let's get into the content of the letter now, all right? Now, remember, <clears throat> the letter is always going to be sent in a standard plain Jane manila envelope, all right? Letter size, nothing fancy, nothing tricky, no different colors, plain Jane letter size envelope. And on the outside, you're going you're gonna to handwrite the recipient's name and address, Always handwrite the recipient's name and address, okay? In the return address, you're going to handwrite your return address and just your name. You can even leave it without the name, but I, I prefer putting my name in the return address. So I would say Gary Wilson, and I wouldn't put all of this stuff in there. All I would do is put 100 Center Avenue, Pittsburgh, PA, 15229. So I would put in... Just the basic return address information. You don't need to disclose on the outside of the letter, on the envelope that is, that you're a realtor, realtor not required. And you don't want to put any um, branding or tagline type information. Just your name and your address. Don't say you're a realtor. You'll do that on the inside on the letter. So, so outside the letter, handwritten, their name and address, and your name and address, okay? Now, the inside of the letter, here's the letter. And again, all of you have this in your material. So um, I'm just going to go over it briefly, but I, I don't want to take a lot of time because you've all got it in your material. I just wanted to describe to you why it's written and how it's written, the way that it's written. Okay, and there's a there's a the sentences are in a certain order by design. All right. So the first thing is the salutation, name specific, dear Clay. Okay. First sentence, you always name the property that you're writing about. So let's say you're looking for owners of three unit buildings, okay? Um, because you have clients, you have buyers who want to buy a three unit building. So you find all the owners of three unit buildings, which I'll go over here in a minute, don't worry, okay? Um, and you write them and you specifically name their individual property. So if I'm writing to Clay or you know Ray Higgins, I'm going to say, I'm writing to you about your property located at 17 Elm Lane in Etna, and you fill in the blank. This could, wherever you are, Phoenix, Atlanta, uh, Orlando, Tampa, um, you know, Lake City, wherever you are, LA, uh, you name it. The, you're going to put your property in there, the property that you're writing about, okay? Now, the next sentence <clears throat> is designed to lower the reader's defenses. <clears throat> so go ahead and read that real quick. I'm not suggesting you sell your property if you don't want to. This is designed to lower their defenses, the reader's defenses, because a lot of investors, I'm using this as an example, by the way, of how to find rental inventory, you know, particularly multi-unit properties. 
So you want to, and these guys are getting letters from other investors. They, they typically say something different like, hey, dear fellow investor, I'm an investor too, and I'd like to buy your investor property while I'll <laughs> live happily ever after in investor land. Um, those letters get thrown away, and we don't want to use them. This letter is property specific, name specific, and if you read this letter, you'd probably wonder, well, what's this about? Why I don't have to sell my property? What's this about? I mean, this guy knows me, knows my property. Holy smokes. Next sentence is a statement of fact. Then you say, so you say, however, all right, inventory is tight right now. Okay, statement of fact, which is true in most parts of the country. Um, and it's particularly when it comes to multi-unit rentals, okay? Um, and what that means to a recipient is, in terms of business, you know, when you're talking about supply and demand, if inventory is tight, that's like, hey, <clears throat> I've got some of this inventory. Inventory is tight. That drives up prices. Maybe maybe I should entertain, you know, the thought of selling this property. So inventory is tight right now, and I have clients like Mr., Mrs., Smith, Jones, you fill in the blank. You put an underscore there and fill in the blank, okay? Now, I always use one of my buyer clients' name, <coughs> excuse me, last name only, <clears throat> all right, and I always get their permission first. So only use one client, last name only, always get their permission. And by the way, I've never had an investor ever say, hey, you can't use my name. They're always more than happy to have me use their name if it helps me find more inventory for them to look at, okay? So, however, inventory is tight right now, and I have clients like Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Davis, who want to buy a a four-unit building or who want to buy a three-unit building, whatever the case is, who want to buy a property just like yours in your area. That wording is very precise and very powerful, right? Okay, now, it's called a power statement, by the way. And a power statement is you're saying, I have clients, plural, and you're so bold, you actually name one by last name, okay? And you don't want to, you just want to use last name, just you don't want to use first and last name. It's too easy for people to look people up, all right? Um, now, what I want to do now is I want to soften them up for my sales pitch. So what I do is this. I'll say, that's why I specifically sought you out, okay? And I did. 30 people may be getting this letter, but I, each one is name-specific and property-specific. I really did seek these people out individually, okay? So I soften them up so they think, oh, okay, I'm – I'm the only person getting this letter, even though others are getting it, they feel that way. So then I say, even, so even if you're just curious about what your property would sell for, please call, text, or email, or please let me know, whatever you're comfortable with, and I'll be glad to give you a free property valuation, okay? Um, now, if you think about it, that wording is very precise. I'm saying what what your property would sell for. I'm not saying what your property is worth, okay? What your property would sell for is a much more powerful message and it suggests to them that maybe they should look into seeing what their property would sell for, okay? All right, then you let them know all your contact information is below, okay? So that's the letter. Now it works very well because it's very short, it's very precise, and what you're doing is you get them intrigued by naming them by name and by and naming their property specifically. You say you, you lower their defenses. You don't have to sell your property if you don't want to, okay? And then you give them a statement of fact. That, by the way, I'm not suggesting you sell your property if you don't want to. It's called a positioning statement. It positions them to read the next statement, which, which demonstrates um, authority and also uh, heightens their sense of uh, interest because you're saying inventory is tight. And the, the, you already know the owner property, all right? Then you th use the power statement. The power statement is, oh, this guy's actually got people. And then it's more believable because you name one of them by last name, okay? Then you make them feel special. That's why I sought you out. So you're continuously boxing the reader in. And you finally, you finally wrap it up by giving them your, your soft sell. So even if you're just curious about what your property would sell for, okay, please let me know. All right, that's the letter, and then you put down here your contact information, all right, and you can put a little uh, tagline if you want. Mine was, we instruct, inform, and assist our clients and advisors in building wealth and income through real estate with their homes and investor properties, guaranteed, all right? That's a powerful tagline. You can use something like that if you want.
okay? All right, I wanted to give you the letter first before we dig into how do you find the people who are going to receive the letter. We're going to do that next, but let me do a quick pause and check for questions, okay? Let's see here. We have one from Peter. Hi, Peter. So Peter says, uh, hi, Gary, just curious, do you ever go, do you ever go look for FISBOs to get multifamily buildings um, if inventory in MLS is low before sending the letter? Um, yes. So actually this letter, um, if the way this letter is used, Peter, in the case of multi-units um, is designed to, to find people who own multi-units and may have some interest in, in selling or have thought about it, or maybe they're just curious about what it would sell for. And this is a really easy, soft touch, non-contact way, or soft contact way to get to get them to respond. So um, the letter is very adaptable, by the way. And I will tell you this, so you guys, if you, if you do, please have pen or pencil handy, because you want to write this down. The example I give here is just to send to people who own small rentals, you know, duplexes, four units, et cetera. The letter is very adaptable. So you could, Peter, you could use this letter to send to FISBOs. You, even if they just are trying to sell a single family home, that may be, that single family home may be a great flipping opportunity for some of your clients, okay? So you could use this letter, if you think about it, literally verbatim to send to FISBOs. If you look at the letter, you almost don't even have to change a single word, <laughs> okay? Uh, by the way, it's also very good for um, uh, expireds. Now, the thing was a letter, it's going to take a couple days to get there. And with expireds, you generally have to act pretty quickly. But I would still use a letter because most people are trying to call. Most agents call. And I can't tell you how many times when I used to go to look for FISBOs, I got, I mean, excuse me, expireds. I realized very quickly, a lot of it, almost all agents at some point are trying to get expires. And I had so many times there, the person answering the phone says, Gee, you know, this is the strangest thing. You're the fifth Keller Williams agent who's contacting me today. <laughs> so like when we go to bowl class, and bowl class we give out a list of expireds, and we ask you to go call them on, and then that's why everybody's calling the same ones, you know. Kind of a funny thing. But in any case, you can also use a letter to send the people who are going through probate. That's your decedents. Um, that could be other flip properties. You can also use it for people going through divorce. We're going to show you that in a minute. People going through foreclosure, I'm going to show you how to find them. Um, you know, people who are uh, uh, pr rental property owners who are in a court uh, case right now, they're in a landlord or tenant case. They might be highly motivated to sell if they're, if they're being sued or they're trying to kick a tenant out. Uh, I'm going to show you um, people who are uh, behind on, on property taxes, okay? I'm going to show you how to find those people, all right? Um, the bottom line is the letter is very adaptable. So yes, Peter, I would use it for FISBOs, um, and I've used it for all kinds of cases. In this case here, these folks may or may not be interested in selling. I won't know that until I send a letter and they respond to me. Um, if their property is, you should always look and see if a property is currently listed for sale. If it is listed for sale, um, you could choose to not send a letter, or what I would rather have you do is, uh, well, I don't see it on here. There's a disclosure that says here, if uh, you're sending it to someone whose property is listed for sale, you want to say it right around here below the facts line, is uh, this letter is not is not intended to solicit business from you. If you already have your property for sale, you're, you're already under contract with another agent, you may disregard this letter. It is not intended to interfere with a contract, something like that, okay? Um, but in most cases, you're going to find that this property is not listed for sale, and so you send them this letter, all right? Now, let me check for uh, any other questions. This is Russ. So Russ says, what do you do if you do not have an investor client yet? So Russ, you definitely want to get your buyers first. So this is a key concept to working with investors. Russ, what we realized early on in developing our training programs is when you work with owner-occupants, you definitely want to get – um, listings first. In most cases, you do when you want to do that because your broker is always saying, you know, go get me more listings. That's true with owner occupants because on, on owner occupied properties, they generally only sell once every 10 years. And, it, and of course, you're going to have one buyer. So, in order to attract buyers, it's great to have listings. That's true with owner occupants. Okay. Um, in the case of investors, Russ, what we realized very early on is it's much better to get buyers first. 
so both your investors Russ get buyers first in fact the the booklet that we went over last week is a great technique for getting buyers and the workshop that we went over the week before is an awesome technique to get buyers okay so you want to get your buyers first get them get them you know build up your database with some buyers then you'll know what they're looking for you know what the demand is and you'll know you should be looking for um, flip properties or you should be looking for duplexes or you should be looking for four unit buildings whatever the case is um, so get your buyers first Russ and then you'll have your uh, your database of buyers that, that allows you to use this letter if you try to use the letter blindly we've had people do it and yes it, you'll get listings that way but if you don't have buyers it's going to catch up to you people at some point somebody's going to call you on it they're going to say hey where's Mr. Matajasic where's Mrs. Smith okay so you have to only use this if you already have buyers um, okay let's see uh, this is Brian hey Brian Brian says hey Gary I tried this letter for a residential client and I got a response seller wanted too much for the property but it was a great to get a chance to review with the client and uh, well thanks Brian I appreciate that um, so you're using it for a residential property I assume you mean owner occupied um, what you might want to try Brian if you're if you're looking for traditional listings um, I'm going to show you in a few minutes here how to go to your county court records and find people who are more likely to be highly motivated to to sell but I appreciate your feedback because you're right the letter is awesome the letter definitely pulls responses you know okay so let's do this let's show you how do you find the people that you send a letter to <laughs> okay so let me reduce my screen here and go back down here okay this is an example of a of a county courthouse uh, records database okay and what I want to do is I want to go you show you some examples of how you find people who are going to be likely interested in what your letter has to say so let's look here I want to go to probate first okay we're in usually typically go to uh, uh, a probate database every court has different databases for different record types I always like to search by date range so I'm gonna click on date range let me click on that okay let's just type I by the way I only like to use one week in a date range because in most areas of the country um, you'd be amazed at how many court records are filed on a weekly basis so let's see this is the 29th by the way happy leap year day to everybody so let's see uh, February 22nd 2016 to February 29th 2016 which is today and I'm going to look for decedent estates so probate refers to estate sales in other words um, a person passes away and they own property and their estate needs to be settled okay if there's no uh, tr living trust or a very poorly written will or no will they it, the property has to be probated it's got to go through uh, the court process so to make sure that the right heirs uh, are there at the right time and get the get what's what's due to them so let's see we can see there in one week look at that uh, that's that's I remember this I don't know how that lost count there but that's probably 40 court records in one week just in one county only just on probate all right so let's pull this up here pull up the first case see what we get all right you can see the decedent party you can see the main party all right and you can see that person's all right name Nicole Frankhauser and their address okay so I'm assuming Bernard is maybe her spouse or was her spouse and he's passed away so now Nicole needs to hopefully get this property she will likely get the property through probate uh, without too much trouble and but more importantly she may be wanting to sell <clears throat> so what you do is this you write her letter at this address right here send it to this address okay name her personally again handwrite her name Nicole Frankhauser on the outside handwrite her address <coughs> and send this letter and if you look here this is very important guys I would definitely make note of this if you notice nowhere in this letter do I say something like dear Jane I understand you lost your husband I'd like to help you in your time of, of distress don't ever say that kind of stuff I know I know you really want to help these folks and I know you think you're being helpful but some people find that offensive and some people find it threatening so what you do is all you say is just like this 
You know, I'm not suggesting you sell your property if you don't want to. However, inventory is tight right now, and I have clients like Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, Mr. Matajasic, who want to buy a property, just a property, just like yours in your area. So you're not indicating that you know that her husband passed away. You're not indicating that you know that she's in a stress. All you're saying is, hey, you know, and I have people who want to buy a property just like yours in your area, and inventory is tight, right? You don't have to sell if you don't want to. But what the heck, even if you're just curious to see what your property would sell for, please let me know. This is a much more user-friendly way to approach someone who's going through retirement distress. Would you guys agree? So let me pull the um, panel back over. Let me see if there's any ahas. Anybody see any big advantages using this letter in this situation versus letters that other people are using? Okay. Um, soft touch. You're still offering help, but you're not focusing in on their, their dilemma, okay? All right, so that's one use. Let me slide the panel back over. That's probate. Let's go back here, and I'm going to, and there's, by the way, there's a number of other types of situations here. Um, you know, all of this, uh, you know, we don't need to look at all that. Let me go back here. I'm going to show you some other court records, okay? So let's go to family division. I'm going to go to search on family division. By the way, you can see there's criminal, all kinds of stuff. Let's go to uh, family search. Um, first, by, We're not going to search by case number. I'm not sure why that came up like that. Um, family search. Uh, maybe I need to do user login. I thought it was search. Nope, sorry, it's user login. Hang on one second. Um, user login. So I go here and I log in, okay? And by the way, this is all free, guys. In, mo in many areas of the U.S. and Canada, uh, this is all free. In fact, I, I need to mention this for Canadian students. Um, most cases, your, your, your county court records and your municipal court records are not going to be online. You have to actually go to the county or municipality courthouse, and I've done this up in many places in Ontario, and I will go into the to the clerk, go visit the county court, ask them to have access to the to the courthouse records. Usually they'll have computers right there, or they'll do a search for you. So, okay. So now let's get back to here. I always like to search um, by date range. Again, and you're going to see I'm a big fan of this because you don't I don't have case numbers right now. I don't even have names to people, but I can find them by doing a date range, seeing what's filed in a certain date range. Let's do that again. So I'm going to dirt, again, just do back a week, so, so February 22nd, 2016, and we'll go to the day, February 29th, 2016, and I need to enter a case type. I don't want to look at all case types because there's going to be too many records. You'll see here what I mean in a minute. So let's look at, um, um, how did I get back to the same, eh, sorry guys, I'm back to the same uh, database. And let's start over again. Sorry about that. I want to go to Family Division, user login. That's what I want to do. So let's look for search. We want to search for records. I'm going to log in. Oh, here I go. Search by, search by date range. Okay. Then type in my date range, 02 22 2016. And I want to search till today, 02 29. 2016. Now let's see what we have here. I'm going to start with arbitration. So let's say, let's do this. Let's key this in. You can see there's all kinds of stuff here. You know, credit card, all this is civil, by the way. Um, here's what we want. Look down here. LT means landlord or tenant. You can always tell a landlord or tenant case by the letters eight or LT, landlord or tenant. So if you look at the letter, let's just pull one up, easily versus Thomas. Let's pull that up. If you look back at the letter, you can see, again, this letter doesn't have to change at all. I can use this letter worded exactly the way it's worded, worded, nice and simple, straightforward. Go down here. I can see that the plaintiff, typically it's going to be the, um, the owner of the property who is evicting a tenant who happens and who typically is going to be the defendant. And most landlord or tenant cases the plaintiff is the owner of the property, <laughs> the defendant is the tenant, because typically the tenant didn't pay rent. Um, all right, you get their name. So Brittany Easley is filing against Juan Thomas, 
and she lives at her address, by the way, the plaintiff's address is 3020 Street. The defendant lives at 5312 Kincaid Street. Okay. Now, here's what we want to do to make sure we're sending the right letter to the right person at the right place. All right. Um, you typically would send the letter to Brittany addressed at her. This is her street address. So that's going to be on the outside of the envelope, 3020 Street. On the letter on the inside, though, you use this address. So you send the letter to Zara Street. Inside, when you say, I'm writing to you about your property located at, you would put the Kincaid Street address. Okay, everybody follow me there? Again, we're going to double check this by going to the tax assessment database here in a minute. We're going to make sure we were sending the letter to the right address and referring the right, the right rental property, all right? <clears throat> in fact, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to remember 5312 Kincaid Street. Let's go look it up on our county courthouse, or excuse me, our county tax assessment database, all right? So let's go there. Uh, let's see. I need to find out where that is. And I think it's down here. Um, let's see. I can find that very quickly. That's Melissa data. Um, you know, maybe I don't have that saved as a favorite. Um, not sure maybe I do, but that's okay. Let's go here. Let's type in um, Allegheny County. Uh, here we go. And let's see if that, that's, that is it. Yep. Legal disclaimer, yes, I agree, all information, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to look up that property. Kincaid was the street name. Okay. And the house number was uh, 5312. So 5312 Kincaid, 5312. Let's search and see what we find here. And there it is. Okay, and sure enough, the property is owned by Sheila. All right, so let's go back and compare our notes here. So Sheila Dixon owns the property, the property at Kincaid. Let's go back to our court record, our landlord tenant case. Um, uh, let's see, Sheila Dixon owns the property. That's interesting. So plaintiff is Brittany Dixon, Dix Brittany. Um, uh, maybe that's maybe that's uh, probably property management. Okay, the defendant. You live in a Kincaid, you can see the defendant, Juan Thomas, is not the owner. It's Sheila Dixon, all right? Um, and let's see, owner mailing is uh, Kincaid. So that's the case right there, actually, where the owner loses the property. I'm not sure why. Um, that's interesting. So that's so that's a, this is why you double check. So I would not send this letter to this person because apparently uh, – Actually, let's check and see. Let's check another case record. That's what we'll do. We'll check another court case record. But what I'm determining here is um, the owner of the property is at the address that Juan lives at. So I'm going to say this is um, – I'm not sure uh, what's going on here because the owner – that doesn't make sense. You know, the owner, this should be a different address is what I'm getting at, all right? Um, so let's find another – case record here um, let's go back and let's check the next one this is a uh, CA properties versus reader okay and actually I know the owner of CA properties so so in any case the plaintiff is filing a landlord tenant case against Shane reader at 209 209 Saline Street so let's go look at 209 Saline Street let's go back here we're gonna do another search and I'm going to type in Saline, and I'm going to type in 209. So let's see what we get here. Okay. Sure enough, um, Bradford and Jaya Rob Robertson, um, through their property manager, has filed a landlord-tenant case against the tenant at 209 Saline Street. And I know this is a, this is a good one because if you look, their mailing address, owner mailing, is somewhere else. It's 1023 Farm Lane, Westchester, PA. So you would send the letter to 1023 
Farm Lane, Westchester. Okay, so that's going to be on the outside of the envelope. On the inside of the envelope, on the letter, you're going to put Bradford and Jaya Robertson, or just put Bradford and Jaya right here. And on here, you're going to say, I'm writing to you about your property located at, and you go back here, excuse me, located at 209 Saline Street. All right. And if you go back to the landlord tenant case, CA Properties, I know is a property management company. I actually know the owner. And you don't want to send a letter there because of the property manager. You want to send a letter to the owner on the tax assessment database who owns 209 Saline. So inside the letter, you reference 209 Saline. And in the letter, again, you don't say, hey, I know you're evicting a tenant. Sorry to hear about that. I'd like to help you out. Maybe I'd like to buy a property. You don't say that at all. What you say is very um, uh, non-threatening. You're not invasive. You're not indicating that you know their, their, you know their business. All you're saying is, I have clients who are interested in buying a property just like yours in your area. Now, the folks who own the property, the Robertsons are going to receive your letter, okay? And they might be interest, interested in knowing what the property would sell for because their tenant is not paying rent on that on the Saline Street property. Now, here's an example of where I would probably use the disclaimer down here. Because it's their property is being <coughs> managed by a property management company, that property management company may or may not do listings. We don't know that. A lot of property management companies don't. In fact, my property management company never did listings, all right? Regardless, you don't know that. All you know is that they're under a management contract. So this is where you would say, hey, if, you know, if, if, you're, if you're currently under contract to list or sell your property, please disregard this letter. This is not intended to solicit business, solicit business from people who are, are already under contract to sell their property, okay? If it's only under contract to be managed, then certainly they can entertain the, the concept of talking to you about listing and selling the property. Okay, so just want to make sure everybody understands that. Matter of fact, let me do a quick check on questions because I just gave you all a, uh, a big handful of information here. Um, okay, let me see, make sure, um, pull this back, go back to my questions. Hang on one second. Um, okay, this is uh, Melanie. Melanie says, once you mail out the letter to the homeowner, how often should I continue to mail it out? Is it one times one per month for a year, like the booklet campaign? Yes. So, Melanie, excellent question. This letter I actually send out, depending on the use. Um, in most cases, I will send it out every month for 12 months because it is a direct mail, you know, um, campaign, direct marketing, and you want to do that every month for 12 months until. Either they, they call you or, or write you back, or they or the 12 months expires, okay? Um, so, in any case, I uh, hope that it helps you. Let me check other questions here. This is from Ray. Uh, let's see. Ray says, should, should the deer, this salutation, should it be the husband's name or the wife's name? Um, well, here's what I would do, Ray. Because on the county tax assessor database, it listed both of them, Bradford and Jaya. I would actually name them both, Dear Bradford and Jaya, just like that. No last name, by the way, just first names, Dear Bradford and Jaya, okay, because they're on here, the database this way, the county tax assist database. That's how I'm going to use it. Good good question, by the way. Um, let's see. I thought I saw another one. Yes, this is Lana. Hi, Lana. Is it possible there is a basement apartment, and that is why the address is the same? Ah, you know what? That's a good good point, Lana. So in the previous example, guys, uh, remember the the owner's address was the same with the tenants. That is possible. It could be a um, an up and down or a side by side, and the owner could live there. Um, that is a distinctive possibility. But what threw me for a loop there, Alana, is the owner on the county tax assessment database was different than the plaintiff in the court case. The plaintiff was um, Brittany. And on the county tax assessor database, let's go back there and look, 5312 Kincaid. Um, whoops, 5312 Kincaid, hang on one second. Um, 3112. Sheila Dixon, 
is the owner. So Sheila Dixon owns the property, and yet Brittany usually filed the landlord tenant complaint. So I'm, I don't really know what's going on here. I'm going to assume Brittany usually is a is a is a, a property manager who works for Sheila Dixon. Okay, and it's very likely you're right that this was an up and down or a, a side by side, and uh, Sheila lives there. She uses Brittany as her property manager, and Juan is the tenant in the basement unit or the upstairs unit or something like that. So very possible. Um, it's just in this situation, you know, I could take my chance and use the letter and send it and see what happens. But I usually have so many, so many possibilities. I mean, look at all these landlord tenant cases, you know, and there's and there's others. And this is just in one week. And this is, by the way. Um, there could be others. I just did one week, and I'm not sure if there's other pages. Let's see. Next page. Let's see. Yep, there's more. More LTs. Next page. More LTs. See what I mean? There's a lot of landlord tenant cases, and because I've got plenty of good opportunities that I don't need to really take shots in the dark, you know. Um, so, uh, uh, you're, thanks, Lana, for doing that. Okay, Melanie. Let's see. I think we answered Melanie's question. Good questions, by the way. Um, Let's see. You're welcome, Lana. Okay. All right. Now, I want to show you some other examples, okay, of how we can use this, other other types of uh, court records. That was just landlord or tenant. So we showed you probate. We showed you landlord or tenant. Um, let's look at family division and see if we get any of the divorces there. And, yes, we do. Look, there's uh, lots of divorces. You guys know that the – Obviously, the, the leading cause of divorce is marriage, right? <laughs> so for every marriage, for every two marriages, you're going to find one divorce. And I apologize. I, I, shouldn't make, I shouldn't make light of it. I'm a divorcee myself, and I would love to be in another long-term relationship. Just not sure when that's going to happen, but maybe, maybe, maybe in the near future. We'll see. So let's look at one. Uh, this is Falkmer versus Gary, G-E-H-R-Y, not me, Gary. And it looks like that's a divorce filing, so let's see what we have here. Okay, plaintiff. So Heather is filing against Justin. I got a feeling Justin made a mistake, obviously. You know, who knows what the case is. But here's what's interesting on this one. I don't understand this. They have two different addresses. Maybe Justin's already moved out. That's probably more than likely what happened. But here's what you can do. This is a really good one because you've got two different addresses. Now you can take that letter. Let's bring the letter up again. <laughs> and I love this because you can see again. Let me reduce my panel. Hang on one second. You don't have to change the wording of this letter. Again, you don't want to say, hi, dear Heather, I understand you're going through the divorce. I would like to help you in your time of, of trial and, <coughs> and sorrow or whatever the case is. Don't say any of those things. Just let them know you've got buyers who want to buy properties just like yours, just like theirs, in their area. So you name them specifically, name their property, and name one of your buyers by last name. They don't know how, you know, everybody else is sending them letters saying, hey, sorry for your divorce, blah, blah, blah. People get tired of hearing that stuff. Again, they could be offended, it could be threatening, and it could turn them off. You're offering to help, but you're doing it in such a way that um, you're not assuming or presuming anything. You're just saying, I got buyers who want to buy your property, all right? So back to the database, what I would do is I would send it one to Heather at this address, and I would send one to Justin at this address. Now, you could go through again and double check and see, did Justin move out? Let's find out. Let's see who the owner of 238 Spring Street is. Okay, 238 Spring Street. Let's go look and see. Um, spring and 238. Let's see what we get here. Okay, there's several. Let's see. We don't know which one this is. Uh, that said Harwick. Uh, it doesn't matter. We have the owner's names here. Look, none of these properties are owned by anybody named Justin. So Justin is probably renting 238 Spring Street. Okay? So maybe you don't send a letter there. But you definitely send a letter to Heather at this house. Looks like she's going to get the keep the house. She may want to sell it and downsize. Um, you never know, but I would try that letter and send it to her. Okay, so that's landlord tenant, that's probate, and that's divorce. Let's see what else we have here. Okay, let's go back 
and let's go one more time. So delinquent tax, let's look at that one, okay? Now here's the interesting thing about delinquent tax. In most parts of North America, before a bank can foreclose on a property, the property has to go through what's called a share sale, and it goes through share sale, but not because the the, the, lend, the borrower has not paid their mortgage. More importantly, they haven't been paying their taxes, the property taxes, and we can see right here. People haven't been paying their borough, their township tax, their school tax, you name it. So let's pick one. Let's pick one of the school district ones because school district taxes are usually higher than any other kind of tax. All right. So we're going to pull this up. The school district is filing um, a basically filing a filing a tax lien against Carl Hilbert and Sherry Hilbert, who both are owners of the uh, same information. But let's see here. We didn't get a lot of good information on this one. Um, we didn't even get a docket number, so let's go back here. Um, actually, we have information up here. Uh, fourteen thousand amount. So they're they they owe fourteen thousand dollars. All right. Um, actually, let's click on this and see if we get what we want. Uh, and there you go. You've got the um, lot and block information. So now you could go to your county tax assessment database. And bring it up by lot and block, okay? And then you get the then you get the the property owner's address to send information to. All right. Um, so let's go back here. Uh, let's see what else we can find. That was so you can so again, if you think about it, look at the letter. The wording on the letter doesn't have to be changed at all. It's exactly perfect the way it's written to send to that person who's behind on the property taxes. You show up with this letter, you may be able to save the day. Um, help them sell the property, pay off their taxes, and they don't have to go in their foreclosure. But remember, every property goes into um, uh, basically a tax sale first in most most municipalities. Um, you know, there's a number of them here, but they're all going to be see, be the same uh, format. Okay, there's the same format. You get the, all the information. Uh, by the way, you can get property owner mailing address directly, and there it is right there. See, that's a shortcut. So you can send a letter right to this property, okay, um, and they might take you up on your offer, all right? Okay, that's uh, tax liens. Let's see if there's one more we can find here that we can use this letter for. Um, here it is. Let's do this one. Uh, mortgage foreclosure. So we're going to see, I mean, bunches of them, guys. Look at that. Uh, Next page, I mean, there's going to be a lot here. So people who are worried about, hey, there's no more foreclosures out there, that's not true. There's a bunch of them. So let's see, we got Wells Fargo filing against Patterson. By the way, if you notice, this is all public information, all right? And so far, every dime of it's, every, every record has been free. I haven't paid a dime for this information. You can see this one was just filed, of course, because that was our record search by date range amount, 148000 So this is probably a pretty decent property. Um, Wells Fargo in Fort Mill, South Carolina, is filing against Kevin Patterson at 1010 Braddock. So let's go look at 1010 Braddock, okay? Let's pull it up. Uh, we're going to search by address, and we want Braddock, and we want 1010, okay? And let's do a search, all right? And you will see uh, Kevin Patterson owns his property. Um, Owner mailing address. Uh, let's see what else we can find here. So he bought it um, for 142,000. Okay, let's look at the owner history. And he bought it just five or almost six years ago. Okay, for 146. That's the purchase information. We can see comparable sales. Okay, look at that. Gives you some comparable properties in the area and also tax info we can see lo and behold he's behind on his taxes all right and that's why uh, Wells Fargo is filing a foreclosure proceeding against this person and I bet you we can find him also on that on the tax lien database he's probably on there too so if you send this guy this letter do you think he might be somewhat interested in, in what you have to say 
compared to all the other letters he's getting from all the other people who don't know any better and are using like generic language and the yellow letter and and um, everything's with a, um, a labels on the ad, on the envelope as opposed to handwritten name and address. Um, that's why I like this letter, guys. It's very adaptable to all these other uses. Um, okay, boy, that was a mouthful. That was a handful. All right, I want to kind of stop here as far as information and content because I just gave you a lot to think about and a lot to use. And again, back to Russ's uh, question, I would um, I would get your buyers first, okay? Uh, now, in this case, um, in the case of foreclosures, the one I just gave you, go ahead and use the letter for the guy going to foreclosure. You might be able to salvage, you know, help him sell his property and salvage his credit. We got a question from Paul, so let's see what we say here. Who Paul says, wouldn't it be necessary to actually eyeball the property to confirm its marketability before approaching the owner? Um, good question, Paul, and here's what I do. Because at my computer, at my desk, at my home, I can do all this in a matter of minutes, I would rather send the letters out first, okay, and then only respond, only work with the people who respond, because if I go out and spend all my time in my car, Looking at all those foreclosures, that's a lot of foreclosures. I mean, this was like, you know, let me go back here. You know, I mean, this is page after page after page. That's a lot of foreclosures. I could use a lot of time, you, you spend a lot of time, energy, and gas and money going to look at properties that really, where people have no interest in working with me. I'd rather start with the people who have an interest in working with me and then go look at the properties. That's a much more efficient use of time. Um, okay, this is uh, Marina. Marina says, if it is a tax sale, this is, is this usually a short sale. No, not necessarily, Marina. Um, it the the bank would could possibly entertain a short sale, and in fact, let's just pull one of these up again. Okay. Now this is a big bank. Actually, let's find one that's a small local bank. Wells Fargo, Nation Star, U.S. Bank, M&T. M&T is. Uh, kind of a small bank in the area. Um, let's see if we see another really small one. Well, let's just go ahead and pull up M&T. Okay. M&T Bank, I know is, is kind of a small bank throughout in New York. You may be able to write them also um, and ask them if they would entertain a short sale. If that's what you want to do. I would prefer to buy properties that already got foreclosed on because short sales take up a lot of time, Marina. And a lot of investors don't want to wait around while, while a short sale is being processed, okay? Uh, let's see. Marina says again, if it is a foreclosure, is it up to the owner to decide whether they want to sell to you? Do we have to get through to the bank? Um, if it's already in foreclosure, you, ha you do have to go to the bank directly. Um, if it's pre-foreclosure, you have to go to the owner. And then what you do is um, once you get the property under contract, Marina, in the case of a short sale, then you use that information to approach the bank and say, I have this property under contract. I understand it's it's in pre-foreclosure, and we would like to work with you to satisfy the lien, sell the property and satisfy the lien. All right? Short sales is a whole different uh, subject, um, by the way. Okay, let's see. This is uh, – um, I mean, is there another one here? Um, oh, no. Okay, that's – we already answered that question. And – I think that was it for the questions. Hey, guys, I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up because we just got through uh, one, two, three, four, five uses of this letter. And, again, you can use it for foreclosure. Um, I'm sorry, you can use it for short sales and uh, expires, too. That's seven uses for this letter. <laughs> so if you're going to use it for people who are not in distress, like people who own three-unit buildings and four-unit buildings, they might not be in a stress. Make sure you get your buyers first. For everybody else, maybe you don't have to have so many buyers, but I would still make sure you have some buyers, okay, because you're telling people, I have buyers who are interested in your property. So that letter is really designed to be used for people who already have buyers. However, you can definitely save the day on foreclosures and bankruptcy and, um, you know, divorce and probate uh, in a number of cases, and also in landlord tenant cases. It kind of short circuits the process because you're going specifically after motivated people, <laughs> okay? So, okay, guys, um, awesome question. So let's see, we got another one here. This Marina, okay, I will, I will, I'm just thinking if the owner has equity in the property, why would they not just sell the property and wait for the tax to fall behind 
Um, you, the funny thing is, is Marina, a lot of people who are in this situation, something dramatic may happen in their lives. And a lot of people who are going through drama, they don't want to deal with all this stuff. They just would have rather put their head in the sand and ignore it and pretend it's not happening. We see that an awful lot. So I know it makes logical sense to sell the property, get the equity out, and you'll, you will find that. And if you, in a lot of cases, you'll find that. But if it's if they already have um, if the bank's already failed or filed, excuse me, notice of default NOD, um, it, it's going to have to be a short sale, and you have to go through jump through all those hoops to make it happen. But yes, you can help save the day and help this guy get equity out of his property. By all means, do it. In most cases, those are you're going to find them. A lot of them, you know, they just they're too far gone. They've given up, or they've they've taken a second you know, home equity loans out, things like that. Uh, or they're going through a divorce and the married couples are the, the, the debating, fighting who owns it, who doesn't, who's going to keep it, who's not. Um, all that kind of stuff happens. Good question, though, by the way. Uh, let's see. Marina, uh, Melanie says, would you put them on a system of marketing or just send the letter once? Oh, no, I would send the letter. And in most cases, I would send it every single month. OK, in some cases, like in the case of. Um, uh you know, let's see what would be a good one here. Um, I would say foreclosure. I would send that letter every week in foreclosure. All right. Um, okay. Let's see. Melanie says, "Great class tonight. Thanks, Gary. Have a wonderful week." Well, you're welcome, Melanie. I appreciate it. I appreciate the questions, by the way. So again, some of those cases I would send that letter out more frequently. In most cases, it would be monthly. And by the way, guys, remember to send me an email. Let me know what you want to talk about next. Um, I'll pick a subject if I don't hear anything, but if you tell me what you want to talk about, I'll dig into it just like tonight, and we'll give you a lot of details. So, okay, guys, I uh, hope a wonderful evening. Uh, for those of you in the Phoenix area, maybe I'll run into you again uh, next week. Uh, for everybody else, if you're in Southern California, uh, give me a shout-out. Again, I'll be back there in two weeks, the weeks of the 14th and 21st of March. I'll be glad to catch up with you. Um, everyone else, um, I'll look forward to seeing you next week, and that is the 8th, next Tuesday the 8th. Okay, everybody, take care. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you for participating, and God bless you. Bye-bye.